Hey everyone, welcome to Pussy Pleasure Secrets, your roadmap to bedroom bliss. I'm hoping that I'm going to deliver some pretty groundbreaking content that you may not have known about or learnt before, and this is going to help you level the fuck up your entire sex life, relationships, intimacy, body literacy, the works. Um, the information that I'll be sharing and the content I want to go through with you is so foundational and so fundamental to, in particular, feminine or female pleasure. Um, and it's the sort of stuff that I find myself going over and over and over with every single client, everyone I speak to, you know, I talk about it on my podcast all the time. This stuff is big and it's just, it's just too, uh, little known about. So my mission, my passion is getting this information to as many people as possible so that you can just have better sex and better connection and just, kind of like raise the bar in your intimacy because too many of us are having, quite frankly, crap sex. I did a poll recently on my Instagram just asking uh, my audience, like, truly, tell me honestly, are you satisfied with your sex life? Are you content? Are you fulfilled? And a resounding 78% said no. And I had over, I think nearly 200 people answered that poll. So that's a pretty massive amount of people that aren't fulfilled and satisfied in their sex lives. Uh, and, you know, a few of them wrote to me, most of them were women and a few of them wrote to me and gave, gave me a bit of a rundown on why. And I was like, okay, cool. All right. We got to do this webinar because so much of the reason why we're having unfulfilling sex and we're not feeling satisfied with our lovemaking and we're not feeling deeply connected and like we're being met properly in intimacy um, is due to misinformation and a lack of education around how our bodies truly work and what we need to feel as deeply aroused as possible and to make the most of our bodies and our arousal processes that are actually working perfectly. Um, and this is like a really common thing that I see and I hear is, oh, I feel like there's something wrong with me. I feel like I'm broken. Um, I feel like my body's not working properly or how it should and what's going on. And I'm just like, oh my God, babe, you are not broken. I promise you, your body is functioning perfectly, exactly how it's designed to, usually, um, but it's trying to function how it's designed to in a broken system. You're not broken. The systems are broken. The culture's broken. The sex ed's broken. You know, we're living in these sort of patriarchal systems and this paradigm that does not value female pleasure, doesn't value women as highly as men, um, creates a culture of people pleasing and uh, self deprecation and putting others' needs first before ours. This is kind of how we learn to be a good woman. Um, and then this obviously impacts our ability to access pleasure and to surrender and relax and really take the time that we need and ask for what we desire because we're already feeling like we're too much, we're too needy, we're too demanding, we're taking too long. Oh, it's us that's broken. There's something wrong with my body. It's not performing how it should or how it's expected to, so it must be my problem. But I'm here to tell you, probably not, probably not your problem. Um, I mean, it's it's a problem, like it's something that you're having to deal with. It's become your problem, but it's not because of you. It's not your fault. Um, and usually when people learn the sort of things that I'm going to be chatting about, and this is totally tip of the iceberg stuff, um, but it's still groundbreaking. There'll be a lot of aha moments for some of you. When people learn this stuff, they they're like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. If only I'd known this, I've been feeling like there's something wrong with me this whole time. And actually, I've just been trying to have sex and function like a man, basically, and expecting my body to perform on cue in a way that a male body might respond. But it makes so much sense now that that hasn't worked for me in the past. So I'm going to share my screen. Let me get this up. Um. And I've got a bit of a presentation for you. How do I make this? Here we go. Um, 
So yeah, let's get started. So basically like my aim with creating spaces like this and doing workshops and webinars like this is to create a really safe space where talking about sex, talking about genitals, pussies, cocks, orgasms, periods, all of that sort of thing is normalized. It's welcome. It's encouraged. It's um, it's fun and playful and at the same time vulnerable and dismantling shame and, you know, fear around these topics that are usually so shrouded in taboo and stigma. So my, you know, my main mission and my passion with my work, with my life, with every freaking conversation I pretty much have is to do this, is to be a safe space, is to normalise talking about the taboo, stigmatised topics that people are usually a bit uncomfortable with or that we're shamed about, um, especially as women. And with this particular webinar, I want to give you a bit of a bumper bumper course, crash course. Um, I'm thinking of bumper crop. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a bumper crop of orgasms and a bit of a crash course on some of the little known secrets to female pleasure or feminine pleasure. Apologies, the language I use is totally binary, but I'm talking about vaginas here. I'm talking about in a female body, what happens to create arousal. I'm going to talk about how you set the scene for the most incredible orgasms and pleasure and how to really like set yourself up to allow your arousal to unfold and blossom organically. Uh, I'm going to chat about some myths and misconceptions that we've all been taught and bought into that wind up making us feel like we're broken and not normal. Um, and I'm going to chat with you about how to best um, utilize this information that I'll share to start setting yourself up for more pleasure and a better relationship with your body and a deeper understanding of your body so you know where it's coming from and you're not kind of pitted against your body anymore and up here in your head being disconnected from your body and your genitals thinking like why isn't it working what's going on why can't I come or you know you're actually coming from a place of understanding and deep compassion and love for your body and therefore getting on the same team and starting to work together this will create a far more nourishing fulfilling and sustainable sex life whether it's you know solo or partnered um, and it will just mean that you're approaching your body and treating your sexuality from this place of deep reverence and respect and, and really honouring how you work rather than trying to match maybe a male partner or a female, like match someone else, someone else's standard basically. So I'm going to give you a bit of a blueprint of feminine sexuality and sexual energy that will give you rule of thumb, bit of an idea about how it's it's common for us to work and what a lot of women like and don't like um but of course take it all with a grain of salt because some stuff you might not resonate with some stuff you'll just be like that doesn't apply to me I actually love a quickie with no foreplay like some people sure you know and there might be different kinks or um you know preferences that are unique to you that don't kind of fit into the categories or the boxes that I'm talking about. And that's totally normal as well and okay. Um, but as someone who works with thousands of women and, you know, kind of nerds out on the topic of female pleasure, um, I'm going to be giving you a rundown of a lot of uh, the most common, you know, the, the sort of things that are experienced by the majority of women. So, you know, that will probably apply to most people just so that I keep it really relatable and applicable to the majority. All right. So just in case you don't know who the fuck I am and you've just somehow wound up here and you're watching this going, who is this person to talk to me about sex? Um, my name's Freya. I am a yoni mapping therapist and a holistic sex coach and educator. I host an epic podcast if I do say so myself called the labia lounge um and I also you know run workshops and offer retreats and I've been doing this for over eight years so yeah it's it's my jam it's definitely my kind of mission and and purpose in life nowadays and I kind of got to this place because I came from a super disconnected traumatized shut down place within myself around sex and around my body um I had a lot of shame and guilt like 
oof, I don't think I touched my vulva until I was 20. And then I was so grossed out by the thought of touching my genitals because, ew, that I put glad wrap around my fingers um, to touch all. And sometimes I would wrap a condom over them to kind of self-pleasure because I was brand new to self-pleasuring at the ripe old age of 20. Um, but I was still so disconnected and kind of grossed out by my own body that that was the only way I could kind of approach it at the time. And so, yeah, I had a lot of challenges a lot of issues around um you know self-loathing and body image I was cripplingly self-conscious to the point where I couldn't I couldn't even be naked during sex or in in bed um with a partner who I'd been with for three years so he'd never seen me naked to my knowledge I would wear bathers in the shower with him I just felt so uncomfortable in my body and so self-conscious of my small breasts and my pubic hair. Like I'm a really hairy person. I've got like thick, dark arm hair and can imagine what the situation was like down there. So I, I just hated it. I hated my body. I hated all of these things that didn't fit into the, you know, conventional beauty standards. And I let this really bleed into my experience in the bedroom um, and the amount that I was actually able to share myself with someone, even though I felt safe and I trusted them and I loved them, didn't make a difference. I I could not relax or be comfortable. So I, I didn't want anyone to touch me on the breasts. I was ashamed of my nipples. I didn't want anyone to touch me on the vulva. I was like, nah, no foreplay, no touching. It's too intimate. It's too vulnerable for me. I don't want anyone to like know about these parts of myself that I hate. So dick in vagina, let's go, that's that. And I'm wondering why I don't, don't have any orgasms um, for the first sort of few years of my sexual career, I guess, sex, se- sexual lifespan. Um, yeah, so I kind of came from this place of just total terror. Um, couldn't go near a penis with my face without nearly bursting into tears. Didn't really like sex in general, like genitals, I was really kind of averse and and resistant to it all Um, until eventually I was like, shit, I can't keep living like this. I really need to do something about this. This is unsustainable. This isn't normal. I was like, surely this is just not normal. I can't live the rest of my life like this. You know, it's not only influencing my relationships, my romantic or intimate relationships, but the way I moved in the world, my confidence, my relationship with myself and my own body and, you know, how much pleasure I could have. So started to tackle it, just set out on a bit of a mission and went really deep um, to heal my own stuff. And through that sort of sexual healing, if you want to call it that, bit cliche, um, I really covered some ground and I wound up in, you know, this space where I was like, damn, that has completely changed my life and my relationships and my confidence. Everything about doing that work just transformed my life in so many like really amazing ways. It was quite pivotal for me. So after a few years of working on that and making so much progress and seeing what an impact it had on my life, I became super passionate about it and I started doing some trainings in body work, in counseling, in sexual education, wound up doing um, tantric body work that moved into yoni mapping therapy and the rest is history. So that's all just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from with this work and why I'm so passionate about it. And also just so that you know you're not alone. And also if you are experiencing anything that I just spoke about, if you are feeling shut down or you have sexual trauma or um, shame and guilt or negative conditioning around your body and and periods and you think it's all gross or shameful or dirty, um, if you struggle to orgasm with a partner, if you are reliant on a vibrator, um, you know, all of these things, I really get it. And just know that it's possible to yeah overcome those challenges and I certainly had a pretty hefty bag of challenges to get through but I've come out the other side and I'm so grateful that I really faced my fears and rolled up my sleeves and got stuck into this work because look at me now (laughs) um So please don't be too daunted. I hope none of this is too confronting or triggering for you. It's going to be pretty chill, I promise. Um, And this is hopefully going to empower you with some new knowledge around, 
yeah, around all of this stuff to help you feel more confident and more comfortable and more empathetic towards your body and yourself. Um, yeah. And of course, I'm always like, I love supporting people with this stuff. So um, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to share with you a little offering that I've got, which I'm really excited about. And I'm going to give you a discount code. Totally no pressure, but I can't help but share what I'm up to and how it's helping people because the testimonials I'm getting are insane. Um, and so I'd love to offer you a bit of a special discount for that. So stick around till the end because I'll share that with you. But in the meantime, enough small talk. Um, I want you to just reflect on why you think it's not normal to talk about vaginas and periods and sex and things like that like why is there so much fear why is there so much shame around this part of us especially for women or for people with vaginas I feel like there's so much uh you know stigma and it's such an area of taboo and fear like we're very oppressed you know these these sort of uh, parts of ourselves that are like sexually empowered and um, therefore more assertive and more centered and grounded in our being and our power and our kind of like self-worth, that is really, really, it's, it's deliberately suppressed. Sounds like a bit of a conspiracy theory, but you know, patriarchy. So it's something that we are having to actively relearn how to do feeling sexually empowered and assertive and as though we're worthy and deserving of our pleasure and of being you know sexually sovereign um there's a really beautiful quote from christian northrup who's got an amazing book women's bodies women's wisdom which i love she's probably got more recent ones that's just an old book but this quote if you want to know where your true power lies, go to the places you've been taught to fear most. Your orgasm, your period, labor and birth, menopause. This is where your real power lies in the sacred temple of your pelvis. So I love this because I'm a yoni mapping therapist, obviously. So I massage vaginas and pelvic floors for a living and I'm quite intimately familiar with pelvic floors and pelvises and I know this to be true you know this is where your cervix is where you give birth to another human your womb this whole area you literally create life and or have the capacity to um but it's it's definitely an area that's been um vilified and not encouraged like we've been encouraged to disconnect from this part of us we've been encouraged to fear it to feel ashamed of it to feel like it's dirty and I think this is because the powers that be especially back in the days where like the church and the patriarchy were starting to come into power more and really start to oppress women they were deliberately suppressing female sexuality because it's the source of our power it's the source of our creativity um and it helps us feel independent and sovereign, which doesn't really serve the patriarchy. So they really wanted to attack us where it would hurt and where it would kind of be a big blow to our self-esteem and um, and our independence, which is sex and vaginas. So I won't go too much into that. I feel quite passionately about that. But <laughs> let's have a little look at some anatomy just really briefly like you can google this this isn't super super important for you to know although it is a little bit sad because often in sessions with clients um you know we'll realize that they don't know the difference between the outer labia and the inner labia and they don't know where their clitoral hood is and that if they sort of lift that back they can see the pearl of the clitoral glands they don't realize that they can reach their g-spot with their fingers like you can see on on the right there um and they also don't realize that there is a massive amount of erectile tissue under the surface, just as much erectile tissue as a man has in his penis, if not more, but ours is all internal. So it's trickier to see when we've got an erection or a hard on or a hard in, as some people call it, in the sex education industry. Um and so what you're seeing at the moment on, on the left is the vulva, the outer visible parts. Uh, 
referred to as the vulva. There's inner labia, the outer labia, the clitoral hood with the head of the clitoris that's able to be kind of exposed underneath that. Um, you can see the internal structures of the clitoris are quite extensive. And then you can actually see in this photo diagram um, the sort of erectile network, which I wish I had a pointer that I could, I could use here. Um, yeah, the clitoris has got crura, which are legs of the clitoris. They run down the side uh, the sides of the vaginal opening and underneath the labia. And then you also have the G-spot, which isn't labeled here as the G-spot, but it's actually the same thing as the urethral sponge. So that sort of uh, cylindrical shape where the urethral opening, you know, your urine comes out, that sheath of erectile tissue that surrounds the urethra called the urethral sponge because it's quite spongy, that is all erectile tissue. Um, so let me just see, I've just, I just want to just double check that I'm recording. How do I, oh yeah, cool. <laughs> Had a little moment of panic that I, <laughs> I wasn't recording. Um, oops. So the urethral sponge or the G-spot is heaps of erectile tissue that when you are aroused and when it receives consistent stimulation over a period of time, it will start to puff up with blood. It'll engorge. That is part of our erectile network. The clitoris, all of that is erectile tissue. Um, the, the vestibular bulbs, which actually you can't really, they're not labelled in this photo they're called they're labeled as the clitoral bulbs in this but the other name for them is vestibular bulbs and then the perineal sponge down the bottom underneath the vaginal opening so if you think of pretty much other than the you know the vagina and the uterus and bladder in this photo pretty much everything you see is a whole bunch of erectile tissue and that expands and puffs up fills with blood when we're really aroused and the tricky thing about this is that we often don't we often don't take enough time or allow enough time for our erectile network to become fully engorged with blood. And when it's fully engorged with blood, it's, it's you know, oxygenating and feeding all the nerve endings that are in those areas that are just hot spots for nerves. So pleasure, potential city. The erectile tissue being engorged is the thing that creates the most pleasure. So like these areas, if they're flaccid, like a flaccid cock, they're not going to have as much pleasure potential and they're not going to be as excitable or sensational because without all of that engorgement and that fresh blood flow to the areas, they're going to feel less sensitive. The nerves won't be all alive and awakened and fed by the circulation. It's going to be a little bit more dormant. Um, and what most of us are doing is having sex with the equivalent of a soft cock. We're having sex with a soft vagina because we haven't given our bodies enough time for the erectile tissue to become fully engorged. So what actually happens is all of these things in the diagram here, they'll fill up with blood and they start to almost act as like a bit of a, a uh, you know, like those blood pressure cuffs that go on your arm and they puff up and they'll, they'll constrict and squeeze your arm. So the vaginal opening is in the center of all of this erectile tissue. So as the erectile tissue puffs up and fills with blood, it starts to squeeze whatever is in the vagina, whether it be a dildo or fingers or a cock, the erectile tissue puffing up will start to constrict and almost act like a cuff around the vaginal opening and the vaginal canal. And this is one way to tell if we're fully aroused and ready for penetration because the erectile tissue forms um, a bit of a cushioning like buffer zone. It's It's got a cushioning effect that acts to protect, you know, the urethra, the G-spot is protecting the urethra. Um, the perineum, the perineal sponge is protecting your anus. And it's kind of all just cushioning so that things going in and out of the vagina, especially if there's a bit of friction, it will be able to handle that more. But again, what's happening is we're having sex way before we're ready to be penetrated. We have something going in and out of us 
quite friction based usually um if you're having sex with a heterosexual dude uh often they will be yeah having some pretty I like to call it jackhammer boning <laughs> um and not always but a lot of the time like people will be suffering from painful sex or numbness or burning and I'm like all right talk me through what's going on like how much foreplay do you have how aroused are you before they stick it in and what we discover is you know they're going way too hard and fast way too early on in proceedings and you know the vagina hasn't had a chance to engorge and actually start to fill up with blood and puffiness to protect itself but the tricky thing is it's obviously quite it's more difficult to see visual evidence of this from the outside than it is to see like a rigid dick. Um, but if you have a trained eye and you're actually looking out for it and you're aware of this and you can tell your partners, you know, they can start looking out for the outer labia getting a little bit like puffier and maybe changing color, getting a bit darker because it's flushed with blood. And you can notice, you know, the clitoris, the head of the clitoris that you'll be able to see will expand in size the labia will start to puff out and expand in size a little bit. The whole area becomes a little bit more engorged and it's subtle compared to a penis that's erect versus a flaccid penis, but there are signs there. Um, so basically the most important thing to know is that if you're not having internal orgasms, G-spot, vaginal, cervical, like deep internal orgasms, uh, and you're wondering why, it could well be because you're not having enough relaxation, warm-up time, foreplay, building arousal to allow your erectile tissue to fill up with blood and therefore the internal structures aren't going to feel as good and they might even be numb or painful. So one really important thing to be aware of is that for your erectile tissue to become engorged, not only do you need time, but you need to be in the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is the side of your nervous system opposite to sympathetic, which is fight or flight. This is rest and digest. This is calm, relaxed, surrendered. Um, it's the side of your nervous system that's activated when you don't have stress hormones pumping through your body. There's no adrenaline and cortisol. You're not like in your head thinking about the next thing that you've got to rush off to do or looking at your phone and getting dopamine hits and, you know, blue light hitting your nervous system and kind of triggering that that um, sympathetic nervous system. So it's actually quite rare that we're in our parasympathetic nervous system nowadays, just the sort of fast-paced, busy lifestyles that we lead, you know, social media, phones, TV, all the technology, all the lighting. There's a lot of things that actually trigger our sympathetic nervous system. And we're just generally so much more stressed. So we're often in a, a level of, of stress and sympathetic activation without even realizing it. And then we're coming back from a busy day at work and we're hitting the sheets with all this stuff buzzing around in our heads and we're having hardly any foreplay. We're not feeling honored and respected and like someone's totally worshiping us and giving us heaps of massage. They're just getting in and out. This is not all the time, but this is a very common scenario that I hear. Um, so if this is relatable to you, take this on board. Of course, we're winding up having penetration when we're still in our sympathetic nervous system. We're still in that stress kind of cortisol, adrenaline activated state. So when we're in that state, our nervous system does not have the capacity to allow the relaxation to have the blood vessels dilate and circulation flow to the pelvic floor and the erectile tissue like it would if we were really relaxed what's actually happening is there's stress hormones in our body. And so our body in fight or flight mode is thinking like, you know, that's a matter of survival. That's such a, it's like a primal mechanism in our nervous systems that we still are run by that evolutionarily was about survival and saved our lives. And we're in the whole oh my God, there's a tiger, run, or like, holy shit, I've got to like survive and act now. We're in that space. And you know what's not happening in that space? We're not fucking horny. We're not wanting to have sex and procreate or like have pleasure. We're thinking like, shit, we got to go. We got to survive. So if you have any stress hormones in your body, that is telling your brain and your genitals, 
now is not a good time to fuck. Now is not the time where I'm going to actually allow blood flow to the genitals because we need the blood flow elsewhere. We're going to pump it to the heart and brain to get the fuck out of here to save ourselves. So it sounds really like extreme, but that's what's going on. So if you imagine that you've just done a yoga class or you've had a really lush bath and you've read your book and you're just feeling super relaxed, you've got the day off tomorrow you know, you've had a massage maybe, and then there's this really lush kind of foreplay, whether that's with yourself or with a partner, and you've actually had time to get out of your head, to get into your body, to relax, to feel surrendered, to feel calm, then you're in the parasympathetic nervous system. Then the blood flow is going to really freely move to your pelvic bowl, and then your erectile tissue will engorge more readily. That will feed the nerve endings. That will generate pleasure, more arousal. Then you're ready for penetration. Then penetration is going to feel good, and you have the potential to have internal orgasms. But we're not doing that most of the time. We are absolutely not doing that. We're not giving our body enough time. We're not paying enough attention to embodiment, mindfulness, relaxation, you know, we're just more is more and faster is better and achieve and, you know, go, go, go. Busy is, you know, it's what we see as being valuable and relaxation is kind of being sold to us as being idle or lazy nowadays, um, you know, in this kind of busy culture. So that's all to kind of give you a bit of um, a bit of an idea about how arousal works in the pelvic bowl. You can bypass this if you're just going straight for the clitoris. That's the other thing. It's like you can have clitoral orgasms a lot more accessibly and a lot more easily with just external touch and they can be quicker. They're almost a bit of, I mean, in Tantra, they talk about them as the equivalent of a male ejaculation, quite explosive, quick peak orgasm, out, done, over, and then the energy just drops again. Um, And you can have those without doing the full relaxation, parasympathetic, um, you know, kind of internal engorgement vibe, but they're not going to be as rewarding and they're not going to be as um, long or deep or nourishing and energetically kind of Um, topping you up they're sometimes a bit more depleting and you might feel a little bit empty or a little bit you know a bit of a drop off of the energy afterwards and this isn't always but this is just you know through like lots and lots and lots of surveys and anecdotal evidence um, that seems to be the general rule like the general experience of people when they compare clitoral orgasms to vaginal internal orgasms Um, but that is not saying there's anything wrong with clitoral orgasms they're dope love them but they're just one part of the picture they're just the tip of the iceberg it's just you know one component of what you can experience if you're starting to delve into orgasmic experiences so I just like to highlight that Um, so here is one of my favorite frameworks or blueprints for approaching a woman's body or someone who has a vagina Um, because it really honors the way that one, feminine sexual energy works and two, female physiological kind of arousal processes and pleasure anatomy functions. And um, it's really straightforward, (laughs) but hardly anyone follows it. And we will often feel like we're being too demanding or we're taking too long if we expect it because for a guy, they can get aroused pretty fucking quickly and get an erection straight away and be ready for penetration in two minutes flat, less um, sometimes. And, you know, whereas for those of us with vaginas, we don't run on that timeline and we need a lot more time and a totally different approach. You know, they talk about in Tantra, if you have a male body, you can go straight for the cock first because opening up the sex center and connecting with the sex center will connect and open his heart. Whereas reversed with females, if you open up the heart and you really like honor this part of them, then that opens up the sex center and you have to approach the heart first before you go towards the sex center. And this is really, really evident when you see how, you know, males have sex and how they orgasm quickly or easily compared to how women, if we had the choice and if we were really honoring our body's needs, how we would have sex, which would be a lot more um 
it would take a lot more time and it would be a lot more sort of gradually easing in. So the framework is called the seven gates of feminine arousal. The first gate, which you have to pass through before you pass through the next, um, is not even involving touch. It is (laughs) pre-touch. It's like the energy that you feel between you. Do you have great um, conversational chemistry? What's the eye contact like? Like that's a form of connecting and, you know, our eyes are like gathering information about the other person just by subconsciously taking in whether their eye, their pupils are dilating or not. You know, there's all of these kind of non-verbal, non-touch ways that we're already forming a basis of attraction and safety. And so like smell, pheromones, do you like their smell? Are you attracted to them just physically to look at? Do you feel honored and safe with them? Like, do you feel like really seen and heard and as though they're meeting you on an emotional and an intellectual level? So all of these other senses that don't involve touch, those things, you really want to get those right first because then you'll receive the touch so much better if you are feeling good about all of those things. So that gate is really important. And then the next gate is starting with some touch, but just the non-erogenous, non-erotic kind of areas that you could touch anyone on those areas and it wouldn't be like, ooh, you know, very non-invasive. So the extremities like hands, um, you know, lower legs and the arms maybe, these are quite non-threatening, quite um, innocuous areas to touch first. And then if that's feeling okay, moving inwards. So starting from out and moving in with genital touch last, you move to like the face and the neck. That's a little bit more intimate, kissing, maybe the ears, these areas that would start feeling quite um, uncomfortable or maybe a bit violating if you weren't into the person. Um, And then moving to the next gate, which is the breasts and the nipples, um, and this sort of heart space area, and also the bum, the bum and the hips. These are like, these are intimate areas that you wouldn't touch unless you were sexually into someone, Um, but they're still not too invasive. They're still not too threatening. So we're working our way in really gradually and we're giving the body enough time and the nervous system enough time to kind of prepare and start to feel relaxed and safe, building that arousal gradually. Um, So yeah, The breasts and the nipples are an amazing gateway to arousal because nipple stimulation, it activates the same area in the genital cortex of the brain. Um, So it kind of associates breast and nipple touch with genital touch and it'll start to go, oh, oh, I know this. Oh, this is, this is a sexy area. This is, this is, I know what this means. And it's kind of lighting up and activating the same area in the brain as, you know, your clitoris. The nipples and the clitoris are actually very connected energetically and physiologically. And you might notice if you're someone with quite sensitive nipples, that nipple touch will start to get things pulsing and kind of waking up downstairs. So next you move to the inner thighs, the mons pubis, you know, your pubic bone and the outer labia. So these are all the areas where pubic hair grows. That is one gate. And then the next gate is the inner labia and the pink kind of moist bits so where the pubic hair grows is regular skin and it's less invasive than the pink mucosal membrane of the clitoral hood the inner labia the kind of entrance to the vagina all of those moist pink bits imagine if you they're separate gates because imagine if you were um if you're getting touched with like a dry finger and you're not really ready and it's a little bit too soon Being touched on those pink moist bits is far more invasive than maybe stroking the outer labia or the pubic bone. It feels very different. It feels, if you're not ready for the pink bits to be touched, it feels all of a sudden like, whoa, you know, it's quite invasive. Um, And you really want to be working your way towards that gradually um, before you hopefully (laughs) lube up a finger or make sure there's a bit of moisture and slickness and then touch, you know, the inner labia, the clitoral hood, the clitoris, um, the anus, and just around the vaginal entrance, not inside yet. And then finally, the last gate, number seven, is penetration of the vagina or the anus. So penetration is absolutely last, and it really is going to be received best by a woman's body if those other gates have been traversed first. 
Um, this is because this is just how feminine sexual energy really likes to work, being approached from the outside, working your way into penetration last, and being approached with reverence, patience, um, and also just to give the body time physiologically to realize what's happening and to be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, all right, let me, let me just like go slip into something more comfy. You know, that's your nervous system is, is preparing itself and it's trying to down regulate out of a space of fight or flight and stress and sympathetic activation and move into a space of surrender, relaxation, um, receptivity to touch and that just requires time like there's no shortcuts you can't I mean unless you're a master meditator that can just do like one minute of meditation and be like boom alpha brain waves I'm fucking in it's gonna take time it's gonna take time to get into your body to get out of your head to kind of shed whatever's happened lately in that day or you know whatever thoughts you've got going around and just start being present with your body and the physical sensations um, and to let your breath slow down and become deeper and to allow, you know, the engorgement of the erectile tissues. So it's going to take time. Um, and touch and really kind of reverent honoring touch like this that's approaching you respectfully and gradually is going to be received really well in general. Maybe as someone that loves a quickie and just wants to be thrown over a chair, great, love it, good for you. Um, but general rule of thumb, this is a really good framework just to be safe, especially with a new partner or if you don't really know how someone works, like better to be safe than sorry. Um, and if you are with, you know, a a person who, I mean, this is just teach everyone this, like, like spread the word. This is just good information to know. Um, and you don't have to always follow it religiously. Maybe you don't have an hour to spend on, you know, foreplay or whatever. Totally. Like we're human, we're normal. Um, we do live busy lives and sometimes you don't have the time or the energy to like put into this, but you don't have to have like a 10 course degustation fucking gourmet with wine pairings, sexual experience every time. You can have a snack. You can, you know, you can just go get some fast food sometimes. Maybe you can have like a light lunch. <laughs> you know, there's different ways of tapping into intimacy and pleasure. And it doesn't always have to be this full shebang. That's okay. You're not failing either. Um, but every now and then, if you can set aside time with yourself and with partners to really just take the time um, and not have any, you know, constraints or time pressures and just savor and, and linger and just kind of like meander around in this space of intimacy and eroticism and pleasure. Um, I promise you, you will, it will pay off. You will be rewarded. Like most of the time, you know, the longer you take and the more you engage in all of this sort of other stuff that we call foreplay, we think of it as sexual extras that are not essential to the main course. Um, all of it's important. And the more you do all of this and sort of spend time helping your body drop into the parasympathetic nervous system and, and build arousal at its own pace, the more like lengthy and deep and nourishing the orgasmic experiences will be and it might be that you can have multiple orgasms or dwell in like an undulating orgasmic bliss that's just you know so much more rewarding and sustainable and ongoing than a quick kind of ex ex expelled clitoral orgasm so to elaborate on this and give you some tips on how to set the scene for really deep pleasure and really fab orgasms, um, we're going to chat about what you can do. And first, I'd love you to just think of or write down, um, you know, a favorite sexual experience of yours where you just had a fucking sick one, <laughs> like where you had lots of pleasure or you felt really connected or really great in your body or really empowered and basically just had a really dope sexual experience or orgasm. Just think about that, picture that time. Where were you? Who were you with? 
you know, what were you doing? Did you have lots of lengthy foreplay? Maybe a massage beforehand or a bath or maybe you were um, on holiday and in a different environment and you didn't have work the next day. Maybe you were just in this part of your life where you felt super in love with yourself and, you know, pumped about exploring your sexuality. Maybe you were alone. And there was no pressure from anyone else. Maybe you were with a partner who you were really attracted and excited by, you know. Um, Just have a think about that now. And then see if you can think of another. See if you can think of a second time where you had a great sexual experience, like one of the the faves that will go down in, in your sexual history as being a top, top five experience. And if you can, either write down or reflect on what similarities did those two experiences have? And if you can think of another, a third, like do they share any commonalities? Were you, um, you know, both times was it the weekend where you didn't have work or were you on holiday? Or both times maybe there was oral beforehand or lots of foreplay or really good conversation at dinner beforehand and you had plenty of time or was it you know really um fiery and passionate because it was with a new person or you know just think of some things if you can identify some things that were the same or common had these experiences had in common And reflect on, yeah, why those experiences were so good. And the reason that I'm getting you to do this is because female arousal in general is super context dependent. It's very influenced and impacted by contextual factors. So this could mean, and this seems like a no-brainer, like it seems really obvious, But so much of the time we're having sex in shit context and we're like, what's going on? Why can't I orgasm? Like, oh, I'm paranoid my housemate's going to hear me through the wall or like I'm so exhausted after a day of work, I just have no energy left over but we never have any time together so I just try to make the most of it. And, you know, there's a lot of things that could be influencing your sexual experiences that you haven't kind of clocked yet. So external or environmental contexts might be, there's a chainsaw going on outside the bedroom window that's distracting you or you know you're too cold (laughs) like all the lighting is really bright or you're self-conscious because of you know the lighting there might be kids in the next room or you might be afraid that they're going to burst into the room at any moment and be like mom mom you know because they're waking up soon or you've just put them to bed but they're not sleeping that well so there's always that chance that they might kind of come into your bedroom um Environmental contexts and external contexts could include like music. Is there no music and no sound or is there like nice music that's kind of sensual and gets you going or maybe there's a playlist that you've made? Um, Do you have a shit ton of housework waiting for you just outside that bedroom door? Are you in a space where you feel comfortable and relaxed or not? Is there maybe pressure from your partner to orgasm and they're kind of asking you like oh did you come did you come yet like what you know is there is there that kind of external pressure that you feel to orgasm to kind of make your partner feel good about themselves and then there's things like so they're quite practical things and often you can control those you know you can make a beautiful playlist you can set you know the ambiance with some lamps and some candles or um you know light some incense or burn some essential oils you might have beautiful fresh like soft sheets on the bed you might get a fucking babysitter or a hotel room or you know like make sure that you've set aside some time where you're not worried about someone bursting into the room or your kids needing you I know that's harder than it sounds but you know are there ways that you can kind of influence your environment and your external context to make it more conducive to relaxation and therefore parasympathetic nervous system and therefore engorgement pleasure orgasms internal 
Fuck yeah. So internal context can be trickier. And this is like the inner self-talk, like the kind of insecurities and self-consciousness, the performance anxiety. Like we might have all of these thoughts running through our head about what we smell like, what we taste like, what we look like, what we feel like. Is my belly jiggling? Can he see my cellulite? Is he having a good time? Is she having a good time? Like what am I doing it right? Oh, why aren't I coming yet? Like there's a lot of voices and kind of inner chatter that we often contend with and that we have to try to quiet um, if we're, you know, hoping to feel relaxed and surrendered because all of this inner chatter is obviously forcing you into um, para- into sympathetic activation and you can't really relax and feel present with your body and with the sensations and be truly embodied if you're kind of up in your head with all of that really unhelpful chatter. Um, You know, it could be stuff like the general mood in the relationship at the time. Is there tension? Have you had a fight recently? Do you feel safe with that person? And I don't mean necessarily physically safe, although that's obviously a consideration, but do you feel as though um, they you know, they're meeting your needs, that they're committed to you, that they're a really safe space for you to be vulnerable and to surrender and relax? Do you feel like they've got you? Um, Do you feel like they can handle all of you if you do maybe burst into tears or have a big fucking groundbreaking, shattering orgasm? Um, And then there's stuff like, you know, just general stress that you're up in your head about. Maybe you had a really rough day at work. Maybe you're putting pressure on yourself to orgasm and that's internal pressure to orgasm coming from you because you're like, why is it taking so long? Oh, I really need to, you know. Um, So there's a lot of different things that contribute to the context that you're heading into this sexual experience with and they're all having an impact and they can have a negative impact. Most of the ones I've just spoken about have a negative impact or they can have a positive impact. Like, Have you maybe um, got a meditation practice or done some yoga beforehand or had a bath or you've, you know, you've lit the candles and you've put some nice music on and you've kind of created the space for your own relaxation and therefore arousal. There's things that you can notice, like I got you to do just before, about the times that you have a great time in sex that are going to be key contextual factors that you can learn from and be like, okay, well, you know, a really common one is um, people have more sex and better sex and more orgasms when they're on holiday. That's a stat. And that's, you know, the reason for that is we're in a different environment. So the novelty and the newness, it's exciting, blah, blah, blah. But also you're not working when you're on holiday. You're on vacay, bay. Like you're relaxed. I mean, hopefully <laughs> um, often you're more relaxed and you're less stressed because you've stepped out of your day-to-day busyness and your life and you've kind of popped yourself into this luxurious, leisurely, relaxing space of being on holiday Um, and that combined with the newness and being in an environment that's a little bit more exciting and different, that creates a really conducive context for arousal. So yeah, you can notice things about your sexual experiences that were particularly good and rewarding and be like, all right, well, obviously that's a good context for me. How can I recreate that? How can I bring more of that in and make sure I'm setting myself up for more pleasure by paying attention to, you know, setting the scene, so to speak? So, and, okay, that had a little thing, a little, uh, little bit of text down the bottom there that I forgot. Basically, what I've just said, what soothes your nervous system and creates conducive context for your arousal to actually just have the time and the space and the relaxation to unfold. Um, And that's going to be a little bit different for everyone. um, But working that out for yourself is really important. So now I want to chat about three common myths and misconceptions about female sexuality that most people tend to believe or, you know, well, we just get taught this and we hear it from different sources and we kind of just don't question it, but I want to like shine a light on it. Um, One myth is that women have lower libidos and enjoy sex less than men because we don't get turned on as quickly and as easily. I'm going to debunk that. Another myth 
vaginal lubrication is an indication of arousal and it's a good uh, signal that a woman's ready to be penetrated if there's vaginal lubrication. That is also misinformation and I'm going to tell you why. And clitgasms are the only kind of orgasm most women can have and most women can't orgasm from internal vaginal stimulation. Keyword is can't. This is what we're being told is that we can't orgasm from internal vaginal stimulation or penetration and that the only orgasm we can have, and in fact all orgasms, are clitoral based um, and, you know, the only kind of orgasm that, that someone can have. This is pretty misleading as well, so I'm going to chat about that. So buckle up. So firstly, it's really important to know about, so like the whole myth around like women have lower libido, like we don't like sex as much, um, they don't want to have sex as much and we don't get aroused easily and stuff. This is this is partially um, because of something called spontaneous versus responsive arousal. These are two different types or patterns of arousal and Rule of thumb, the majority of women or people with vaginas have responsive arousal most of the time. The majority of men have spontaneous arousal most of the time. So this can fluctuate. It can change at different times of your cycle, different times of your life. But rule of thumb, most women most of the time will have responsive. Most men most of the time will have spontaneous forms of arousal. And what this means is, say for a man, like I was talking about before, he can get an erection straight away, often, not always, um, be turned on quite quickly and it's quite fiery and like DTF straight off the bat. Um, and sometimes, like you've seen in that classic trope in in the you know coming of age movies where poor teenage boys are getting spontaneous erections in class and having to hide them with their folders and, you know, men can often get horny out of nowhere for seemingly no reason. Not always, but it's more spontaneous. Um, and this style of arousal is kind of the one that we see in the media, in porn, in you know movies, and it's the one that we glorify and value because it's the way that men get aroused. So that's kind of been our blueprint or the thing that we measure sexuality to because all the fucking research is about male bodies and the patriarchy means that, you know, pretty much the, the standard or the... Um, the expectations that are that are set around things are generally based on a male as default kind of blueprint, which is problematic, but don't get me started. Um, yeah, we kind of learn that, uh, you know, it's better and more uh, healthy or, you know, desirable to have spontaneous arousal because then we just get horny out of nowhere easily um, and that obviously looks like a higher libido um, versus responsive arousal styles, which are more common for women, where you actually need some kind of sexually relevant stimuli to kind of trigger or wake up your arousal. So your arousal will actually only start to kind of come online and build in response to a sexually relevant stimuli. It needs fuel to just like ignite those flames. Whereas spontaneous arousal, it's kind of just like lighten up on its own. It doesn't really need as much fuel all the time. Sometimes it'll just burst into flames out of nowhere and that's that. Whereas responsive, it's like you kind of need to like, you know, you need to have a little lighter and then you need to put some kindling on and slowly build that fire and, and fan the flames, which is kind of, you know, again like highlighting this different way that feminine sexual energy works which is more gradual it is from the outside inwards and it takes a bit more patience and nurturing um but once it's there and once it's hot it'll be you know on and it'll be at that simmer for a longer time whereas like you know male sexual arousal can extinguish itself very quickly once uh, ejaculation happens so Responsive arousal, meaning that, you know, maybe we don't necessarily feel turned on just on our own, but if something's happening that's sexually relevant to us and that's different for each person based on all sorts of things, but, you know, that could be reading an erotic novel. It could be seeing a sex scene in a movie. It could be um, getting a massage or it might not be until, like if you're anything like me, it might not be until someone's actually 
touching your genitals or sucking on your nipples or doing something explicitly sexual to your pleasure zones that then the arousal starts to build and actually be like, oh, okay, all right, here we go. Um, So it's going to be different for everyone, but often because our arousal is more responsive, that looks like, oh, well, we just don't like sex as much or, oh, we have lower libidos because we don't initiate sex as much or we don't feel like it as, as readily. It's not actually the case. We love sex just as much. The statistics show that women have the same level of libido, like on average to men. Um, yeah, we don't orgasm as much, but that's more about the way that men are having sex than us because same-sex relationships have far more orgasms than heterosexual for the women. Um, and so, yeah, what's kind of happening is like we're buying into this like narrative that women have lower libidos, we don't like sex as much, we take too long, you know, and that's actually not the case. It's, you know, more a case of our arousal following a different pattern and responding to different things. So that's important to recognise because it's not – um, it's not any, you know, better or worse than the spontaneous style of arousal. Like they're both very normal and they're both common for different kinds of people. But the way that we're conditioned is to reward and see spontaneous arousal as more um, desirable and kind of more sexual and exciting because, sure, wouldn't it be nice to just spontaneously get turned on really easily like and some of you might but you know responsive arousal it just takes a little bit more patience and understanding and so it's not better or worse but we see you know in this society where the man's body is the default and that's what we're measuring ourselves to and we're seeing movie scenes where they kiss for like two seconds and then they're fucking and porn where they're just bumping uglies and everyone's having big orgasms out of nowhere with like fuck all foreplay and we kind of are like taught um yeah that spontaneous arousal is better and if we are needing to take longer and respond like have responsive arousal then that's not okay and we reward fast-paced kind of instant gratification quick fixes magic bullets like we want results fast we want we don't we don't have we're not patient anymore because of the way that you know society is these days like we want that instant result um and we often don't have the patience or want to be bothered taking the time with something like a female body that might require a more patient uh, approach. So the other myth about vaginal lubrication being an indication of her being ready for penetration or being turned on, not necessarily true at all. So there's this thing called arousal non-concordance that's like a big word to basically say that our subjective arousal, how turned on we actually feel in our heads um, doesn't match our genitals. So sometimes maybe we'll be feeling like super fucking turned on and like, yes, I want to fuck the shit out of you, but we're dry as the Simpson desert down there. And sometimes we might have vaginal lubrication happening, but we might not actually be feeling that turned on or ready for penetration. And a pretty extreme uh, example of arousal non-concordance comes in uh, instances of sexual assault where the victim is actually experiencing, you know, either vaginal lubrication or an erection when they fucking don't want it. And they're like, whoa, and they feel like their body is betraying them. Um, but, and, you know, sometimes you might be in a, in a sexual setting where you're just super into it and you're like, yes, yes, yes. Um, But you're not wet. And so the guy's like, oh, like you mustn't be turned on or you you mustn't be ready. And then there's this whole shame that we have around using lube because we're being told that unless you can get wet on your own, then you shouldn't be being penetrated and you're not ready for sex. Sometimes this is helpful. I mean, definitely, you know, get some lube to help you and obviously pay attention to vaginal lubrication because you know, that's cool, but it's not the be all and end all. And it's definitely not a reliable indicator of whether we are actually turned on and ready for penetration. Um, And the difference between male bodies and female bodies here is that 50% of the time for men, 
their genitals will match up with how turned on they're feeling. So if they're feeling turned on, they'll probably have an erection. There's still some non-concordance where they're turned on, but they can't get an erection or vice versa. Um, But for women or for female body people, 10% overlap, only 10%. So only 10% of the time, the physical arousal signs of getting wet actually match up with how turned on they're feeling. And that's not much. So, you know, when um, teenage boys are like, oh, she was so wet, like she wanted it, Mm, buddy, not necessarily. And it's really like not a green light. So please like educate your partners and make sure you know this as well. Um, Just being wet doesn't mean that it's the okay, like let's get in there. It's, um, It's not not really reliable you should be looking out for other signs like engorgement and puffed up erectile tissue um and actually checking in emotionally and you know with with the person verbally about are you ready for penetration are you turned on are you into this like are you ready literally has to just as simple as that little sentence it can just be like are you ready or how are you feeling um and you know kind of paying attention to like their breath and their sound like are they making moanings are they seeming into it in all of these other ways use other indicators of arousal not just whether they're wet or not so the final myth or misconception is around clitgasms and there's a whole lot of kind of misinformation out there and like really misguided and misleading studies that will kind of phrase their um, conclusion as like only 20% of women can have internal orgasms or you know whatever and it's just like okay so actually what's happened there is sure the study has showed that only 20% of women do regularly have internal orgasms but it's not that they can't it's that we're having crap sex with people that don't know what the fuck they're you know doing and don't know how to approach a female body and we're not getting enough time and foreplay and parasympathetic activation and we're not feeling safe and honored and respected and it's too friction based and there's so many reasons um poor communication like oh my god there's so many reasons why people are having subpar sex um and not coming from penetration also the way we self-pleasure or masturbate massively impacts how we have sex and whether we can orgasm with a partner there's a lot of things I go into it in my course and my coaching work like in depth because so many people are struggling to have internal orgasms um, and orgasms with a partner because of these reasons and there are ways that we can train our body um, out of the habits that that it's in and into new ones but I really want to highlight like clitoral orgasms are not all you're capable of. They're great, but they're just the tip of the iceberg. And the, you know, the studies or the information, the the, the experts in the field, which is questionable because, you know, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that people were saying the G-spot and the clitoris didn't exist and that the cervix has no sensation. And hell, people were saying babies couldn't feel pain, like not that long ago. So, you know, take all of these experts with a grain of salt Um, because in that kind of medical science community, like there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge. There's massive gaps in the funding. Female pleasure and reproductive health is severely underfunded. Um, Anyway, that's a (laughs) tangent. Yeah, basically like what they're saying is, is really limiting. Like it's a limiting mindset to be like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so said that only 20% of women can even orgasm or all orgasms are clitoral. So there's no point like penetration. Women just don't even get anything from penetration. So why bother? Because it's not fucking true. We can all experience vaginal orgasms internally, G-spot, cervix, blended orgasms. There's lots of different types of orgasms or orgasmic experiences and clitoral is just one. And sure, the clitoris is generally involved because of the structure of, you know, the clitoral and erectile network. It's all enmeshed. It's all kind of touching and connected and enmeshed with the G-spot and the A-spot. And, you know, it's kind of hard to like completely bypass the clitoris and why would you want to? But all orgasms are not just purely clitoral and yes you can have internal orgasms um g-spot orgasms can elicit squirting or female ejaculation or both cervical orgasms can be these really kind of earth-shattering full body energetic orgasms um you can wind up like having cry or heartgasms and 
there's all of these different experiences like throat gasms are a thing did you know crazy nipple gasms um anal gasms there's lots of different erogenous zones and blends of different areas and pleasure potential that create orgasmic experiences and I don't find it particularly helpful to like put a name or a label on it and be like what kind of orgasm was that that I just had or I'm gonna try to have this kind of orgasm because you know that's that's kind of limiting or minimizing of the experience that you are having and I don't want to be too goal-oriented about this or too analytical because pleasure is pleasure and I'm fucking stoked to be having it if I'm having it so I don't care if it's you know a g-spot orgasm or a clitoral orgasm or like whatever um but I just want to highlight you know the sort of orgasms that a lot of us are having are usually clitoral yes but it's not all that's possible. It's just that that's happening because clit is more accessible. It's external. It's really easy to find. It's really well known now, thank God. Um, And it doesn't require penetration or a whole lot of like time um, or even knowledge like of, you know, pleasure anatomy or your body. It's definitely the easiest and quickest orgasm to have. So that's the one that people are accessing the most commonly. Um, And like what I want to encourage is kind of thinking of orgasms as maybe not necessarily that peak kind of quick orgasmic experience that's like just over quite quickly, like an ejaculation or a clitgasm. where the the energy builds up and it peaks and then it falls away, you can actually, you know, when you actually spend the time, uh, you create the context and you set the scene and you observe the seven gates and you approach really gradually because it's important to be in the parasympathetic nervous system. Like if you're paying attention to all of those factors that I've talked about, you can get to the place where, yeah, sure, you can have a quick clickgasm, but you can also take a bit more time and, you know, stick around to experience really deep internal orgasms that will last longer. It might turn into a bit more of an orgasmic state rather than like an orgasm that's just this kind of peak uh, blip, you know, thing that happens like a sneeze. <laughs> um rather being in like an undulating state of orgasmic pleasure that kind of fluctuates and is like coming in waves and it doesn't just peak and then fall away. It's more of a state that you dwell in for a longer period of time. And this is more of a multi-orgasmic state. Um, So the thing that I teach about like the most when it comes to this sort of stuff is how to train our body and our brain to diversify our pleasure pathways, to create new neural pathways to pleasure, to wake up and activate and bring online the internal parts of your vagina so that you're not only able to access clitoral pleasure, you can actually start having all kinds of like different forms of pleasure and orgasmic, you know, states from your whole vagina, pussy, yoni, whatever you want to call it. Um, this can be trained. You can condition and train yourself to do this. You can create, you know, pleasure pathways and train your brain and your vagina to respond to more diverse stimuli and different forms of touch. And yeah, it's something that you can work on. It's a practice and it's a bit of a use it or lose it thing. Like the more you do it and the more you kind of, um, yeah like expand your pleasure horizons and practice becoming a master of your body and your pleasure the more insane incredible states of pleasure and orgasm you're gonna be able to tap into more and more easily the more you practice it so now I want to just like chat a little bit about this offer that I've got for you um And I'm super excited because, you know, basically what we talked about in this webinar, that is the tip of the iceberg shit. Like that's the foundational stuff that I want everyone to know. It's all the fundamental stuff to kind of form a basis of knowledge and understanding that will get you going. But I really love going deeper with people and privately coaching alongside my online course that I've created. And I, and I made it because, um, 
you know, it's it's a it's a vulnerable topic for people to <laughs> to kind of work on. And so being able to do it at your own pace, in your own time, from the comfort of your own home is sometimes more accessible and appealing for people. And um and it teaches you oh everything from how to be more confident and embodied in the bedroom, how to have better communication um, around sex and with partners. By the way, it's only for people with vaginas. Sorry, guys, if any guys are watching this. But there's a lot of videos in there that if you have a male partner, you can show them that and then they can learn and then you can practice together. Because throughout, there's lots of home play practices for you to put into action and um, actually like learn to embody it in your life and practice these tools that are going to just make you so fucking orgasmic and like empowered in the bedroom. It's not funny. Um, It's a three-month online program you um if if you are experiencing anything like sexual trauma sexual shame and guilt um, issues with confidence in your body and in the bedroom libido and arousal um, if you have challenges with orgasming with yourself or with a partner or you want to um you know learn to have more pleasure and different forms of orgasm if you struggle with communication boundaries talking about your desires and your needs um performance anxiety there's a big module in there about menstrual cycle awareness Um, if you want some support with painful sex or numbness inside your vagina if you're dependent on a vibrator and you want to break that reliance if you are lacking self-love and self-worth this is for you and over this three-month period I'll trickle out the content although you will have lifetime access so you can chip away at it at your own pace but over three months I'll be yeah tackling all of your biggest challenges and fears and goals when it comes to sex and pleasure and there'll be a combo of like theory and video content where you're learning a lot of cool information and thought-provoking you know sort of stuff and then there'll be guided audio practices and video practices meditations and visualizations embodiment exercises heaps of fun home play and like practices that you'll do at home to consolidate the the knowledge um, and sort of get an embodied experience of what I'm teaching. And there'll be some demos, masterclasses from guest teachers and experts that I get in to chat about and teach you about different um, things that that are out of my wheelhouse. It's super jam-packed. There's so much value in there. Um, And it's just, it's the sex ed that I wish everyone had. This is why I created it because it's going to just feel so empowering and so fucking good to have this tool in your toolkit. Um, so there's payment plans available. Um, if you want some extra kind of layers of accountability, I love working with people. There's a private coaching plus the online course package. It's the same price as privately coaching with me, but you get the course as well. And I love that because then people have the foundation of all of the course content that they'll always have access to. And then we have the, you know, the tailored approach that I can give you with one-on-one coaching as well alongside the course. And that's where, you know, you get the best results, but the course is amazing on its own as well. And what I've done is I've used a platform um, where there's extra layers of accountability and there's inbuilt incentives and surprises and rewards so that it keeps you motivated because so many people don't finish online courses and I've created this as a certified experience product, which means it's gamified. It's like really kind of like hitting your dopamine button and it's engaging you way more than regular online courses um, through cool little surprises that you'll see once you're inside the the course platform Um, and you're going to have lifelong resources that you can keep you can refer back to you can redo the course and different modules at different times and show partners things and refresh you know the knowledge as you need because you'll have access to it long term so what I'm offering for participants of this webinar because I love that you've stuck with me this far and I hope you got a lot of value out of it Um, I'm offering $200 off the price of Queen Out, the course. And then if you wanted to do the course plus private coaching package, $500 off. So basically it's 20% off. There's limited spots with the private coaching though, because I only work with, you know, 
few people at a time just to make sure that I can give them my all um, and because it's quite personalized and quite, uh, you know, it's more intense. So if you want one of those, get onto that um, quickly and, and let me know. You can use the code 20% off. You can see it right there. Um, and I'll pop a link to that somewhere, but you can just go onto my website, freyograph.com. Um, and click on online course and you'll be able to check out what's involved in the course and you can plug in 20% off as your discount code at checkout. Um, and I would just love to have you there. So that was a slide that was in there when this was going to be live, but my Wi-Fi shut its pants. So anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for watching this. I, I, um, yeah, I just know that it's going to help you level up your sex life and your experience in the bedroom. And I hope that you can, you know, tell people about this and spread the good word and help educate others. I'd love to see you in the course because my gosh, there's so many people and this is not a criticism if this is you, I get it, but there are so many people that consume all my free content. They're like, you know, they're in the, they're looking at the stuff and they're taking in resources, they're reading books, they're listening to podcasts, but they're not taking action. And they are feeling like they're, you know, um, moving forward and they're doing the work without actually having to properly do the work because they've never quite invested and committed um in any real tangible way and they just kind of hang back and they're taking in the info that's out there for free but not having any skin in the game basically and if you're not you know investing and actually committing and having that accountability and being you know vested in the interest of completing something and actually doing the work and putting it into practice in your life then you're actually not going to get the results that you want. And none of the stuff you read on Instagram or listen to in a podcast will really stick. Um, and I love it when people go, you know what? No, like enough's enough. I deserve this. I want to invest in myself. I want to make change, lasting change in my life. Um, that's why I created this course. That's the kind of person that I want to just be like, right, let's do it. <laughs> so if that's you and you're sick of just, settling for crappy sex or intimacy or feeling self-conscious or uncomfortable or shy, ashamed, or any of any struggles or difficulties, honestly, with sexuality or your body or relating, this course is for you. There's everything in there from communication to menstrual cycle awareness. It teaches you how to do your own self-yoni mapping and trauma release, massage inside the vagina, cervical work, de-armoring, um you know pussy care there's a lot there's a lot in there it's all my best and favorite tools and teachings and practices from my eight years experience in this industry and I've just put it all in one place to create a step-by-step -step roadmap for you so I really hope you take advantage of that and I'm gonna shut up so thanks everyone I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to stop stop recording bye <laughs>